Honorable Minister, it's uh, such a pleasure to have you with us. Guests, friends of the Centre, it's my great pleasure to welcome you this morning to the Global Centre. Bonjour et bienvenue à tous. Nous sommes ravis que vous êtes ici avec nous pour cette discussion inspirante avec uh, Elman Peace Centre. I have the best role today. Um, I get to discuss with these two exceptional women about the work that they're doing with the Alman Peace Center, and we're so pleased that all of you are with us today. My name is Meredith Preston McGee. I'm the Secretary General for the Global Center for Pluralism. I'm particularly excited about this event because I had the privilege of living in East Africa for about 20 years and, and working um, for a time in uh, Somalia. And uh, really, the work of the center and the depth with which um, they approach issues of peace is really such an inspiration. So I really can't wait to get to the discussion. Um, before I hand over to Benoit Fontaine uh, of KBF Canada, who's going to make some opening remarks, I, uh, I did want to acknowledge that we are here on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. You'll see um, out the window on this beautiful day that we are privileged to sit at the banks of the Kichisibi, the Great River, that has been a point of connection and gathering for centuries. It's also, of course, been a point of dispossession and violence for First Peoples of this land. And so these cycles of connection and gathering, of building trust and building bonds, juxtaposed against cycles of violence and dispossession are themes that we'll hear from Ilwad and Fartoon today. But there are also themes that we in Canada need to remind ourselves that they're part of our own history and they're part of the society that we are all collectively shaping today. So I really hope that we all think about that and see what lessons we can also be learning from Ilwad and Fartoon, not only about Somalia, but about our own process of reconciliation in Canada. So you'll hear more from me um, in a few moments, but for now, I will hand over to Benoit. We'll say a few words, and then we will ask Honorable Minister Hussein to say a few words to open the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Meredith, uh, Honorable, Honorable Minister, ladies and gentlemen. Well, first of all, I've got to apologize for my strange accent. So I'm, I'm Belgian. I, I live in, uh, in Quebec, in Montreal, but I don't have the, the accent from Quebec. Um, I'm, um, so Benoit, together I'm here with uh, Ronit, my colleague, um, from, and I'm the executive director of KBF Canada. KBF stands for King Baudouin Foundation. Uh, Baudouin was um, a former king of the Belgian from, um, uh, until 1993. So um, first of all, I want, to, I want to certainly thank the, the Global Center for Pluralism. Um, I want to thank you, Meredith. I think you are the perfect person to, to moderate this debate. And as you explained, you lived in the country, in the region, um, and in Kenya and in this, this um, um, East African region for many years. So you are really the perfect persons to moderate the debate. And thank you to your team for organizing this, um, this event. Um, so the mission of KBF Canada is to support projects everywhere in the world. So we, uh, mainly focus on um, many projects in Africa and in Europe. And um, we do that with um, Canadian donors. We, we created the foundation five years ago, but the, um, the history of the King Baudouin Foundation goes back to 1976. Um, and um, every two years we um, select an outstanding organization and um, leaders from Africa who play an important role for the development of Africa. Um, we, to, to, to select Elman Peace, we did receive 600 applications from all over Africa. And again, all organizations must be led with local leaderships because we think that's very important for the, de for the development of, um, of, of these countries. So we made um, the jury, the, 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 it's an international committee, made um, a bold, I think, um, decision to select Elman Peace with young leadership. Well, I have to say it's the mother and um, also the daughter. So it's, um, we cannot look at um, one without the other. But um, uh, you'll see what's going to speak. And um, she has a lot of um, maturity for her age. And we really believe that uh, the organization has a lot of future, not only in Somalia, 
but also to advocate for peace um, more broadly in some African countries. And we are going to speak about that. And I mean, the, um, the KBF Africa Prize for Development um, supported some people that you probably know, like the Dr. Mukwege in Congo, like um, Mohamed Yunus, who invented the microcredit, a very well-known economist in India. And then they became, after, maybe be proud to say that, after being having um, received the KBF Africa Prize, they became Nobel Prize winner, Nobel Peace Prize winner. So maybe that's um, an ambition, I don't know. But that's, uh, <laughs> that's uh, tout le mal que je vous souhaite, if I can say that in French. Now, I'm very happy to, um, uh, before doing that, uh, to say that uh, the discussion will be in English. And if some people want to, to raise some questions in French, most welcome, of course. And I'm very happy to introduce Honorable Minister. I don't think that he needs to be presented. Um, he's, <laughs> he's, he's born in Somalia. Um, but um, I mean, he has all the legitimacy to, to speak here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, merci beaucoup. Uh, bonjour, bon matin, good morning. Subah uh, Wanaxen. Je suis uh, je suis heureux d'être ici aujourd'hui avec vous. It is a pleasure to be with you all, and I recognize also that we are all gathered on indigenous uh, Algonquin and Anishinaabeg territory. It is a real pleasure for me to welcome back uh, Ilwad and to meet uh, Fartoun. Uh, it, uh, the the work that you 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 continue to do and have done really speaks for itself, and I particularly particularly. Um, welcome your focus on young people, women, marginalized individuals, to empower them to be involved in peacemaking and peacekeeping. It is a really innovative way to tackle um, uh, issues around peacemaking, peacekeeping, uh, uh, conflict resolution, and so on. And we have to support that in every way that we can. Uh, the first time we met, I believe it was at the UN uh, when I was Minister of Immigration uh, at the UN General Assembly in 2018. And subsequently, we've, we've, we've kept in touch and I've seen the, uh, the work that you've done, uh, not just in Somalia, but beyond. And uh, you're an example to all of us on the power of, um, of hope, of, um, uh, of agency, of the ability to... Uh, envision a better future, uh, not just uh, for the people, but actually doing it with them and empowering them in the process. Uh, I can uh, say that um, for many, many years, we've seen uh, the struggle of the people, the, the Somali people for a better future. And we are all connected in some way to uh, either Somalia or that part of East Africa. Um, and what strikes me, um, repeatedly is the uh, resilience of the people, their uh, defiance against all odds to not only survive but thrive and, and build a better future for themselves and for their families. And your um, efforts in building peace, in uh, building uh, a more empowered uh, community, in empowering individuals to really uh, better their own environment and build peace and make peace and, and fight for a better future for, their, for themselves and for their families is really, really commendable. Um, you know, when you, uh, when you look at um, news headlines, when you look at uh, um, visiting journalists and their reports, it doesn't really capture, it doesn't even come close to conceptualizing what's really happening on the ground. Uh, if you look at the mother who is selling something by the roadside uh, to provide a little bit of support for her kids so that they can get an education, so that they can have a better future, that's the real Somalia. When you see a diaspora member going back and opening a business and empowering people and hiring them and training them, that is the Somalia. When you see young men and women uh, putting on a uniform and fighting uh, terrorism, fighting foreign fighters in Somalia and securing peace and security for folks living not just in Mogadishu but way beyond in the countryside. That is the Somalia that we're talking about. 
when you see ports, universities, hospitals opening, being funded partially by the Somali government, but also being par partially funded by ordinary people through generous donations. That is the Somalia that we're talking about. When you see those cranes going up and down, building new buildings, uh, opening, uh, uh, you know, uh, book fairs and film festivals and cultural exchanges and sports uh, festivals and uh, sports competitions and sending athletes to the Olympics and the World Cup and so on. That's the Somalia that, uh, that I think needs to be highlighted more. But in that context, at the very top, I would say, the cherry on that cake is the Ilwad, uh, is the Ilman Peace Center, and uh, led by, ably, by two incredible Somali women, Fartoon and Ilwad. And for me, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here this morning. And uh, every time that uh, you come to Canada, my door is always open uh, to not just welcome you back to your home, to your adopted country, but to also always, always, um, reassure you that we're with you and that anything that I can do in my power within the government of Canada to amplify your voice, to amplify your work and to find, uh, always look for more ways to support you and your work uh, is, is for me an honor and a pleasure. And we all have to remember, I think, as a, as a human uh, community that um, we, don't, we don't just need to ad admire the, the work of these incredible women and like-minded people, but we also need to support them because it's very difficult work. The, the work and the responsibility that they've taken up on their shoulders is very heavy. And it is, uh, it's, a, it's a heavy duty and it's a, it's a constant fight and a constant battle despite all the odds. So the least we can do is not just continue to encourage them, but find ways to support them. And in that regard, either as a private citizen or as a member of a government that has a feminist international development and foreign policy. I'm always, always here to amplify your voice and find new ways to support you and hopefully um, increase the impact of the work that you're doing on the ground. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. Assalamu alaikum. I'm being mic'd up as we speak. Technology in action. Um, Fortuna and Ilwad, if I could now invite you to the stage and we'll begin um, a conversation. Um, I will, uh, I promise I won't monopolize the conversation. There will be lots of time um, for questions and answers from the audience. I did want to just, again, um, Minister Hussein, thank you so much for your remarks, which I know were also really from the heart about um, what Somalia really is and the power of a society that is not just defined by conflict, but is so much deeper than that. And I know that that is really gonna be at the heart of the conversation that we have today. And your ministry as well, looking at issues of inclusion and diversity is again so critical in, um, in the work of the government of Canada, but also as an example for other governments to really take these issues, issues of pluralism themselves at the core of their mandates as ministers. So again, minister, thank you so much. I'm conscious that you have a day job and you can't stay with us uh, throughout all of this, but um, but I know you would love to. So again, thank you so much. We wanted to take the opportunity again to to say Mahat uh, Sanit and Chimigwech, merci and thank you. So for tuning in, what if you know? So can everyone still hear me? I'm a terrible timekeeper, but I am going to try and keep us to, to time. We're at 9.30, so we have an hour for this portion of the discussion, which I'm quite certain I could spend the entire hour talking about the extraordinary work that both of you have done just through the bios that I was sent from both of you. I'm going to let that come out, of course, in the conversation. So we'll begin really just by very briefly introducing the Alman Peace Center. We have a wonderful video that we wanted to show before we dive into the conversation. So for anyone who um, has not read um, more about it or, or indeed heard uh, the interview on CBC Ottawa Morning this morning, the Alman Peace Centre is a non-profit organisation 
Founded in 1990, working to build peace in Somalia and beyond. Alman Peace is dedicated to promoting peace, cultivating leadership, and empowering marginalized groups to be decision makers in the processes that ensure their well being. For me, that really is pluralism in action. Alman Peace is visiting Ottawa as part of their North American tour as recent recipients of the KBF Africa Prize that recognizes outstanding contributions to development in Africa, initiated and led by Africans. So we'll now turn to this video, which I think really beautifully tells the story of the creative approaches that Alman Peace is taking to their work. So we'll hand over to that just now. They say trust is really easy to break, but very difficult to build. What we are trying to do in our work is restore trust. Trust in systems, trust in governance, trust between people that don't have any other obligation or affiliation with each other. Young people that have been ostracized from the community, that have been stigmatized and have been labeled as dangerous, we're trusting them by bringing them into our programs and they're trusting us by going through the different initiatives that we've described. When we receive the children and they stay with us, the first for us is to educate them. Because I believe that education is change. We have some of the who never touched the band, and they come to us and actually now go into universities. It, it shows you, if you put effort to it, people can change and give opportunities. When we create space for children from different backgrounds, they feel comfortable talking with one another. We can use group activities as a part of the healing process, whether serving, yoga, or sport. The goal is for them to feel reconnected to the community at large. Our approach at the Almond Peace Center is three-tiered. The first pillar is supporting the individual recovery, the essential services that they need, whether it's health services, safe housing, mental health support, psychosocial well-being, and anything that ensures this person has the response and service that they need to overcome some of these traumatic issues that they've experienced. The second is preventing these issues from happening again by working towards social norms change within the community. And then the final pillar of our work is also on policy to ensure that there is reform and processes that actually hold perpetrators to account and protect communities and promote justice. The work we do is very risky and it's very challenging. We take a good care of ourselves so that we can be ready to take a good care of others. There are a lot of girls who have gone through the sexual assault, the emotional assault, the physical assault, different problems uh, within the community. Elman Bees is very important because they give them the hope they need, the motivation, a place where they can come, show their ability, where they can speak up. The only constant in Somalia is change. Change in the environment, change in people, and as such our approaches and our interventions always evolve as well to, to the changing environment that we're working in. A lot of the work that we do is scalable to other contexts as well too, because it's grounded on principles of listening to the individual and really empowering community members to be a part of the processes that ensure their well-being Peace is so much more than the absence of war. It is community. It is the people who have the potential and opportunity to pursue the best version of themselves. It is an enabling and progressive society. It is a society that is at peace with itself. Video and I love seeing the um, the footage of uh, of the, the vibrant streets and I miss the tuk-tuks I have to say. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I will just briefly introduce you both. I do feel like you need no introduction, but I'm going to do my due diligence and, and introduce you both before we dive in. So Fortune Adan, as you know, this is an intergenerational team, so the mother, <laughs> is the founder and executive director of the Alman Peace Center. Fortune is a humanitarian educator and leader. She fled Somalia in the early 1990s with her three young daughters and sought refuge in Canada, leaving her husband and partner in her humanitarian endeavors behind. Fartoon's husband and Ilwad's father, Alman Ali Ahmed, was assassinated in 1996 for his work disarming youth being forced to fight for warlords. In 2006, Fartoon returned to Mogadishu to lead Alman Peace, founded in honor of her late husband. Fortune is a leading expert in the reintegration and rehabilitation of children associated with armed forces and groups and a valued source and partner for scores of researchers, donors, and human rights organizations focused on the Horn of Africa. Ilwad Elman is Director of Programs and Development and the Chief Operating Officer of Elman Peace. Ilwad was raised in Ottawa and is a 2019 Nobel Peace Prize nominee. Ilwad is at the forefront of the Somali peace process and a global authority on ending conflict and preventing violent extremism. Ilwad also sits on the Commission for the Principles of Peace, which aims to transform approaches to peacemaking globally, an initiative that the Global Center is also really proud to be a part of. At the age of 19, Ilwad felt the responsibility to leave the safety of Canada and return with her mother to Somalia, where they founded the Alman Peace Center. And since then, Ilwad has been a champion of building peace through giving all those impacted by conflict, particularly women, girls, and youth, a seat at the table. She's designed security sector reform interventions, created inclusive spaces for women in peace building, developed programs for the disarmament and rehabilitation of child soldiers, as well as adults defecting from armed groups who've been labeled as terrorist organizations, and supporting social economic empowerment, rehabilitation, and reintegration. And I have to say that I, dramatically shortened your biographies. There is so much more to tell. Um, so again, it's such a pleasure to have you both here and a huge congratulations again on the award. Thank you so much. So I just wanted to kick off with a question that is really to both of you. I was really struck um, when you watch the video and you hear about your work that you speak very holistically about what you do. I think too often, as, as the minister has, has said, we, we think of Somalia as a two-dimensional space, a space that is experiencing violent conflict and we're not understanding the depth of what that means. We're not looking at the wider societal fabric that's affected and how we embrace the approaches to rebuilding that societal fabric in order to build peace. And so your work touches on human rights, on peace and security, on education, climate change, justice. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how all of those threads intersect in your work. Do you let mom go first? Okay, yeah, always. <laughs> Fortune, please. Um, thank you very much. And we all appreciate you guys coming here and getting the award. It was, uh, it's not only you get the award as the Elman, but also it was uh, more opening doors in Somalia, talking about the issue, what's going on. It's not only war, but also life behind that. And when you see the video, it's uh, you show me. You live there, you have a life, you have a lot of diaspora coming back, you have a businesses. So a lot of things going on, and which is very hopeful for all of us. So to see that and to understand is uh, very important. Coming back to your question is um, the way we work is uh, it's connected. When you receive um, come, someone coming to you and they need everything, the education, justice, you will help as much as you can. And the good thing is we have worked with the government. We have a lot of uh, uh, outside Somalia supporting us which is really um, great for us because uh, without that support, we couldn't do the work we do. You can see we're doing it in a serving in Somalia. It's not like something normally we would know in Somalia. So we get that because support to other people and to show we're not only killing each other, but also we can also do this. So it's always connected together and uh, we don't have the way we want it, like the justice. And when you see the victims, and I see the human rights, we write a report, and not knowing where to go, you know, it's ended. It's, it's difficult. And, but at the same time, you have to have a hope. 
you have to see things are getting better. We change it. And whoever we reach to, they always support us, honestly, because of the the legacy and what was Elman is and in Somalia we have all these different tribes and different area. Wherever place we go, we always welcome <laughs> people welcome us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the work we do it shows our and why we do it. Because if I go back to Elman, before proposal or other things we use in our money to do to rehabilitate the youth, <coughs> to create the jobs. So it's not about new organization just doing it. And we carry in the legacy, the word they get kill about it. So that's why it's for us it's hundred percent mm -hmm to do it every time. And it's a lot of sacrifice we make, and mm -hmm. we're still doing it. So it's a, it's a, if you want to give up sometimes, honestly, sometimes I think I can do it. I'm giving up. But at the same time, I'm saying, oh, what else I can do? Mm -hmm. I came back to Canada, stay a few days, and go back. Yeah. Because I see the need, I see the mm -hmm. people, I see I one day how many people I can help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What if I'm by myself and sitting there and buying a coffee and drink it? It's not <laughs> like something I want. <coughs> so that's pushing me always mm. to go back and mm. to do. Mm. And I'm grateful for the people all around me working with us. Mm. And mm. my girls, they all came back to Somalia one by one. And I, I didn't want them. I asked them to stay in Canada because I know how risky it is. And I'm here, so please don't come. All of them, they buy from their ticket and they came. But you must be glad they disobeyed you. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they came and I, they really do amazing work. Mm. My youngest is, is a soldier. Wow. And she educated in Canada, coming back to Somalia and be a soldier. It's not normal. But at the same time, that's what she wanted. And she was really doing a great job. And she wanted to help us. Mm especially the organization for security for she does so many things yeah. but sometimes when you see like losing my other daughter it was like horrible for me and i always have regret saying why did i go mm. and then that's why, you, that's why your work is so important because you are touching so many people Hmm. But it's hard. It's hard. Um, but I think that we need to your testament as well to of your reflection about the video is that there is one narrative really that plagues Somalia, and one very myopic and mm -hmm. surface level perception of the country, and that has foreign policy implications. It has humanitarian implications, and maybe just to add as well to that. This video that we showed is really about the ethos and spirit, spirit of Elman Peace. It's not your traditional nonprofit NGO. Look at what we did and how many people that we reached video. Because what we want to transcend in this video is really that there's collective action. There is movement, there's society, there's people, there's love. There is a movement. And that can be quantified by indicators and targets. and. What we do at Element Peace really is try to enable leadership, to cultivate leadership within the community, but also enforce that it needs to live beyond project timelines and shifting away from charity to investment in people and society. And at, at the core of it too, it's also about dignity. So instead of showcasing a video that would propel Somali people that are in a very difficult conflict and humanitarian situation with messaging like for a dollar a day you could feed a child like Ilwad instead showing that this is what people are doing in Somalia in spite of the challenges and now how can we support them to lead themselves and push towards a more plural and progressive society themselves so I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you also recognize that this is um, a new destructive way of looking at Somalia and the opportunities that exist there to your question about the many different portfolios that we have it really is all interconnected. Mm -hmm. We recognize that human life and nature are inter interdependent. Every initiative that we've founded in Somalia and that we support links into 
the other. So from the outside, it looks like we're kind of scattered and all, all over the place, but you can't do one without the other. At the core of it, we are a peace-building organization, but we recognize that peace is so much more than the absence of war. Mm -hmm. We monitor, document, and report on human rights violations and abuses, but that's not enough without providing services. We've been reporting on sexual violence in Somalia for years, and many other actors have as well too. But it wasn't until 2010, when we founded the first rape crisis center, that we began to respond. Somalia has been receiving international aid and assistance for decades. So when we say in 2010, we founded the first rape crisis center, people are shocked. How's that possible if all of these actors were there? Sometimes we need to match resources to rhetoric and actually do something instead of just looking at the issue. And in 2010, just like now, Somalia was engulfed with a terrible humanitarian crisis and a drought that saw more than 350,000 people die. Women, mostly with children in tow, were coming from all the regions to Mogadishu in desperate search of aid. And in those IDP internally displaced people settlements, they were raped, their aid was looted. It was an open secret, secret in society. And back then, we were able to generate a conversation on sexual violence that never really before existed by just doing by acting and actually providing a space for reprieve, for, the, for health services, for um, education. And since then, that's grown to nine different locations in Somalia. Mm. But then we also saw that we can't just work to protect women and girls. We need to support them to rebuild and reclaim their lives. And so we invest in the socioeconomic empowerment of women and girls through entrepreneurship, through financial literacy, through investing in small to medium enterprises and actually giving them the tools to escape cyclical trauma and scenarios in which they are oppressed and challenged. And then that also led us to start working in more formal education sectors as well too. Mm -hmm. In Somalia and around the world, there's global campaigns around girls' education. The challenge that we see in Somalia is that one, education is 100% privatized. If you have the resources, you can go. If you don't, you don't or it's organizations like us who provide education. But when it's donor driven, that means you can only offer it for a year or two years depending on mandates and funding that's available. And with 56 active armed conflicts in the world today, Somalia that's been in war for 30 years, it's not always the, the sexy country that people want to support. Mm -hmm. So to create a sustainable and systemic investment in girls' education, we build schools and associate it to social enterprises that can generate revenue to support the teachers because if we have the teacher's mm -hmm. salary mm -hmm. and the infrastructure, then we don't need to constantly seek funding. Mm -hmm. And our work with children and youth that are leaving armed groups is connected to that as well too because we recognize that the underlying grievances and vulnerabilities of recruitment are connected to lack of opportunities for youth, idleness, poverty. So to prevent recruitment, to build peace, we need to invest in youth, and in Somalia, 78% of the population is under the age of 30. 56% of that is 15. And the country's been in conflict for 30 years. That's essentially a nation of children, which presents both opportunity mm. and investing in these malleable minds for a better future. But it's also challenging when the demographic dividend is not harnessed but instead viewed with such fear from mm. the minority leadership of adults. Yeah. And then that also connects with our work in climate change. Because mm -hmm. globally, the 1.8 billion youth around the world, when asked and surveyed in many different capacities that I serve in, the biggest priority that they have is climate and environmental degradation that we see at scale globally. And Somalia is no different than that. All of these children are going to inherit a country that is at the nexus of both climate and conflict, mm -hmm. with cyclical humanitarian crises, with massive weather shocks. And our work on environmental issues started because we saw our peace building work not being sustainable mm -hmm. unless we addressed environmental issues. Mm -hmm. Someone is in our program for about two or three years. And the goal is to return them to their area of origin. But that's not possible when the area that we're returning them to changes so rapidly. So we recognize that the two twin crises of security mm. and the climate are fueling each other and 
we have groups like Al Shabaab in Somalia that are poisoning water wells, burning entire farms, increasing the vulnerability of people by attacking the environment. So we champion climate change topics and reframing what that looks like in other places of the world so that Somalia is not left behind. But um, so it, everything fits into everything. Yeah. You know, the National um, Gallery of Canada next door has um, a, a, had a rebranding exercise this year, and um, part of it was that they were given um, an Anishinaabe word, Ankoste, which is everything is connected. Yeah. And I think that's really sort of the, very much the ethos of, of what you're talking about. There's so many things that I wanted to, to dig down on, and I know, um, Elwa, that you're particularly passionate about youth and peace building, and so I do want to return to that. But I wanted um, to touch again on education, because I think that's so key of what you're talking about, <coughs> and this lack of sustainability. And I've heard this in other societies where children get to go to school for a year, and then school vanishes again. And the trauma in that itself of being offered something and then having it pulled away, or being offered something that is so marginal that it's not offering them the opportunity to grow as full citizens. And when we think about pluralism in education, we think about how do you educate the, the whole person. It's not just teaching someone to read or write, it's really teaching them to be the kind of empowered citizens that you're talking about in your work. And so I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about your education programs and how you're seeking to um, really empower this, this young generation, which is really the, the population itself um, of the country. Yeah. Yes, um, I, are, we, are we on? Is she on? <coughs> you can be heard? OK, yeah. great. Okay. Um, we start education. I believe education is most important, especially girls. And in Somalia, it's limited. It's not a lot of girls can get this education. Even if you based on the project, it's not enough, as you said. So we always advocated to have a public education and also to have a long, sustainable schools, even if it's not the government, but also organizations like us to have that. So that's what we now actually started as an Elman um, leadership schools for girls, and it's going to be a four years. So we built the, the school, but also we wanted to have the teachers and to make sustainable instead of project, but we wanted to do that. So it's a very important. We built the two schools in Central Somalia and Mogadishu. So that is the one of the now we're doing it. And also we are working still vocational training and the employment, which is a very important. And it's also Somalia right now. Is the schools are private, so people can afford it. They don't go with the vocational, those schools. They go doctors and lawyers and that big thing. And at the same time, Somalia is a lot of construction. A lot. So our youth, they get the jobs right away. While they are in the school, they get the jobs. And we have so many connections with the business community. We also have so many people who are coming back to Somalia and diaspora and wanted to help. So we always connect it, and they get a job, and it's amazing how they can mm -hmm. benefit on that. So we always appreciate those people who are really working with us. Awesome. But it sounds also like what you're doing, again, from this holistic perspective, is saying it's not, I mean, if you're educated and unemployed, is that as frustrating as being uneducated and unemployed, that you have to connect to having something to contribute back in, in the society, as, as you say. And Elwood, on the, on the perspective of youth in peace processes and seeing youth as a threat, seeing youth as this dangerous demographic that we need to, to worry about, I know you've spoken really profoundly about this um, the, with the Principles for Peace Commission as well. And what would you like to see people sort of do differently? And what have you seen from the work of Elman Peace in terms of the engagement of um, youth in these peace activities and, and sort of what that's meant for this transformative approach that you're taking? Mm. Maybe just uh, on the education elements as well, too, because I think this is um, an important sector that you know a lot of people can get involved in supporting, um, especially in a place like Somalia as well, too, with that is still developing the national standardized curriculum that's still very much prioritized education. What we have been also looking at is um, making curriculums in our institutions that take into account, of course, the um, national uh, curriculum that's not yet standardized, but then also looking at models that actually empower people from illiteracy mm -hmm. with 
skills that support them in the community. Mm -hmm. So we made um, uh, an adaptation of the Apollo for Reflect model, which essentially instead of teaching someone A for Apple, when you're teaching them the, the alphabet, you would teach them like H for human rights. So it's a rights-based approach to education. And um, that has been really helpful for us in also teaching skills, literacy, numeracy, but then also character development mm -hmm. at the same time. So our educational investments are in tandem to promote that, particularly in Somalia, where we have very high dropout rates of girls as soon as they become um, adolescents to teens. And um, we try to also engage parents to support girls' education and not force them to drop out at a certain age. And this also is connected to social norms change, challenging the harmful traditional narratives that there's only so long a girl should stay in school. Mm. And um, facility is the most important part of that, actually having space to have those conversations. On the youth peace and security agenda, I worked on um, and co-authored some of the text in the, the resolution 2250. And it was the first resolution on the positive role of young people and peace and security processes. So not only in Somalia, but globally, young people have always been looked at as either um, a group that has a big question mark on it. We know every social movement in history has been championed and led by young people. So rightfully so, they can be radical, but radical is not a dirty word. <laughs> um, and this resolution was, was historic in the sense that it surveyed young people all around the world and actually developed an empirical evidence base of the initiatives, the leadership, and potential of young people to be assets in building peace globally. And that's both here in Canada as well, too. We had held consultations in Vancouver. Um, we looked at young people in Palestine to, to, to Yemen and Somalia. And consistently, what we saw is that, yes, young people are already effectively leading in peace and security, but they all face the same systemic exclusionary um, barriers as well, too. So that resolution was very important for opening the conversation. And since then, there have been several subsequent resolutions by the, the UN on mm -hmm. really uh, continuing to channel this message. But the reality is the challenges still maintain. They still exist. And um, the, the narrative is there, the, the commitment, all the right words are being said right now. But the challenges for participation at the most granular level, even in Somalia, for example, is access to participate. When young people want to join office, mm. to even be a candidate for a member of parliament position, you have to give, you have to have five thousand dollars as a woman and ten thousand dollars as a man. Where is a young person that has one of the highest unemployment rates in the world going to get ten thousand dollars just to be on the ballot? Young people are allowed to participate in non-threatening issues when it comes mm -hmm. to peace and security, peer-to-peer mm -hmm. -peer engagements, sports, um, volunteerism. But the moment they start to participate in counterterrorism, when they leverage their uniquely positioned influence in the community to reach out to active combatants and create pathways for defection, all of the hard security measures young people are not allowed to participate in, mm -hmm. which is a big contradiction, particularly in the global south, where young people are trusted to pick up weapons and fight other people's wars, but they are not in the room when it comes to negotiating, mediating, uh, preventing armed conflict. And that's what we're trying to shift. Looking at where young people are uniquely positioned to influence peace and security processes. So as part of the work with the Principles for Peace Initiative, we've been able to look at peace building agreements globally. And statistically, UN peace building agreements don't last more than seven years. We invest so much in political peace that we overlook the opportunities for social peace. Absolutely. And looking at building peace from the community. And young people, I think, are not waiting to be invited anymore mm. to this proverbial decision-making table and are creating peace at the community level. And that's mm. what we champion in Somalia, helping young people to recognize their potential, working on district, um, district level reconciliation efforts, young people that have gone through our rehabilitation and reintegration programs now having new positive identities and leveraging their ideas and creativity to actually create peace in the community mm -hmm. and not looking at big national targets when you are able to create success at even a small scale. Mm -hmm. But those are building blocks. They absolutely, national, yeah. yeah. 
And I wonder, I, um, I'm not going to monopolize the conversation for more than one more question. Um, but I do, I, I think it's really important. There's been sort of a theme throughout that we need to reimagine also how we engage with conflict, how we engage with Somalia, how we understand things like sustainability of education, the holistic nature of these things. And so uh, my experience um, with uh, Somalia and international interventions in Somalia over the years has been so profoundly frustrating when you have people who live outside the country, don't live inside the country, see Somalia only through perhaps a counter-terror lens, see Somalia as um, subordinate to other regional priorities, see security over um, real social cohesion and these sorts of processes. And so I wonder just before we open the floor, if there's anything that you would want to say in terms of how the international community, how Canada can be doing business differently to try to be supporting the sorts of work that, that Elman Peace and others are doing in the, in the country. Fratun, maybe I'll ask you this. Without the support, nothing we can do. Mm -hmm. We can't change anything we want to change. So mm -hmm. we're working because of the support we are getting. And clearly, to have a more sustainable instead of one year, two mm -hmm. years for Shakti, but more than that, we can make a different way mm -hmm. to see the difference. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, for example, our organization, we never close the doors. Mm -hmm. For Shakti or without for Shakti, it's mm -hmm. always we do the work we do. And we do fundraise for Somali community. We do fundraise other friends we have. But you can work based on a year or two. You have to have a long <coughs> sustained franchise. And I know Canada, they were involved the conversation and then and the work we do in Somalia for a long time. But nowadays, I think they, for security wise, mm -hmm. I think, they work in areas like Somaliland mm -hmm. and that side which is also, also is very okay. But they can, they can make more mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. active in Somalia, mm -hmm. especially now. Now in Somalia, they really have no war. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. people are fighting. And these people whose the government is trying to liberate, at the same time, they have so many women and children inside that war. And they need a right way to support them, instead of waiting years later. Mm -hmm. They need the support right now mm -hmm. or to make the sustainable in that area for the liberation. Mm -hmm. And organizations like us can work well mm -hmm. in that areas to do the work, not only military, but also we need as a civil society to work okay. these kind of issues. And you're mm -hmm. able to stay within <laughs> the security so often an international organization would, would be leaving and, and, and you don't. And I think your point about the long-term nature of what you do is so important as well. You can't give hope to someone by coming and going and closing something down and then, and then promising them something that, that doesn't come. For sure. For sure. You know what? <coughs> um, I think, well, Canada is very influential globally, um, a big supporter in the multilateral system and, you know, has values that very Canadian that everyone knows. That's what Canadians are known for, for protecting, promoting um, human rights on a global scale. And of course, no country is perfect. There's still a lot of challenges even in this country as well too. Um, but I think that the opportunity that exists with Canada particularly is if the values that Canada stands for include um, feminism as articulated in the new feminist foreign policy, on diversity, on, um, on culture, and recognizing how multicultural Canada is and how much of a population exists in this country of people that are first generation, um, that have a strong connection to their countries of origin, that there's an opportunity for Canada to also enable its uh, community in Canada to be a part of creating more enabling and progressive societies for their country of origin. And um, that's one of the things that we've been discussing with different leadership of the Canadian government as well too, with this new um, partnership that we have with the KBF Canada and the opportunity to create programming jointly with Canada in Somalia, but other places as well too. Mm -hmm. If you are going to stand for certain ideals, 
I think that it's so um, important that you also ensure that other people outside of Canada can benefit from them too. Mm -hmm. So really leading with the things that Canada is for outside mm -hmm. of Canada too. Mm -hmm. um, we have, of course, a critical mass of the, the diaspora in, in Canada here, just looking around this room, even <laughs> from, uh, from the creative space, from policy, from education, and all of those skills are so mm -hmm. important. But I recognize too that my journey of going back and staying in Somalia is not going to be the same as the other young Somalis that are maybe in this room or from different backgrounds too, but have skills that they want to give back, not just to their country, but also neighboring countries too. Mm -hmm. And I think that Canada is uniquely positioned to, to, to leverage the, the interest of young Canadians mm -hmm. to do more and be more in the world mm -hmm. by creating opportunities for doing so. Um, and we'll get to exactly like how people can get involved, but I think that for us, the same way that we engage with Canada, we engage with the, the rest of the global nations and looking at how do you actually stand by the things that you say so eloquently at the General Assembly, in front of the parliamentarians, in front of leaders, but actually match that with action. And action not just in terms of support for civil society and the work that you're doing, but in political spaces and sometimes in the rooms that are closed off from Absolutely. the youth or yes. from, from um, women and, and girls and so forth. So. Um, I'm sure lots of you have questions that you want to ask our guests. Um, there are a couple of microphones that can circulate, so if people can um, put up your hands. Um, oh, what a quiet room you are. I know there's questions out there. If there aren't, I have a million more. Anoush. Assalamu alaikum and shukran. Thank you so much for this very powerful example you're giving about determination and hope in action. So it's inspiring and uh, here it's inspiring as well too. Um, I have a question about you know, the work that you've done now for some time has given you insights about the causes for conflict. Mm -hmm. And I would love to hear a little bit more from you about where you think it comes from in this in the problem solving part of the equation, your sense of where it comes from, and specifically, I I'm wondering if you might address this question of colonialism, and whether uh, uh, you see connections and and how you see them. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Should we take a couple? Should we take a couple questions? Um, are there other questions <coughs> we might we can take maybe a couple together, Rabia? Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, alaikum. How are you guys? <laughs> I love the work that you guys do. Um, I had a more political question. Do you guys, there's a follow up if not, but do you guys work with um, Somalia's government? Do you guys interact with the government in place? And then based on the answer, I have another one, but I'll wait. There are other, first round, we have one more there and then we'll, um, we can go back. I don't, I don't even know where to begin. First of all, I'd like to thank KB Foundation for recognizing the work that you guys are doing and to the Center for Pluralism for bringing it to us because this is such a powerful story that I had not heard of. Um, I have so, made so many notes because everything that you were saying was like a clip that you know I wanted to remember. Uh, nature and human life are interdependent. Peace cannot be, is not just an absence of war. Like powerful, powerful words. And I'm going, here is an organization that is like not even looking at metrics in a very old fashioned way. You're creating your own metrics. So I'd love to hear more about it, but I don't know if there's going to be time. The other thing I wanted to also find out more about was when you said nature and human life are interdependent, and then you have like what we see in Pakistan with the floods. It's it's they're saying that it's you know it's not the country that is creating, you know that is that is being impacted by all the uh, you know resu results of the pollution that we're creating in other countries. So when you look at nature and human life. How, like, what is it, the, how are you planning for things that are so much beyond your control because everything is really interdependent in, in terms of the success of your work? Thank you. 
And in the wider region, let alone yeah. internationally. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, um, I have one more hand up, and then I'll <coughs> maybe ask the two of you to reflect a bit on, on those questions. Um, I, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. I think my, uh, my question's around more um, the youth and how to encourage the North American youth and youth across the world uh, to invest in their homelands and to go back to their homelands, mm -hmm. right? Like Ilwad, you went back at a young age when you were very comfortable here and you had something to take you back. You know, you had your father's legacy, you had your family there, mm -hmm. you had this wonderful organization that you could go back to and do meaningful work. What would you do, what would you say to the youth that are living comfortably across the world how would you encourage them to go back and invest in their own countries? That's a great question. <coughs> okay, well, we'll take those, and I'm sure there's more to come. Um, Linda Fortune, did you want to start? Yes. Um, so um, I'll start the, the one you're talking about, the nature. And you know, in Somalia, the climate change affected so much, but we don't know. And then we see the river every year is dry. Mm. Thinking, okay, what happened? It's supposed to be raining season, it's not raining. So we don't have the knowledge to understand what's going on, but it's affected so much and so many lives. Nothing grows now because of no water. So this is the globally people are understanding and talking about it, but it's new to Somalia. And that's why we wanted to do more, to advocate, to understand what is, nothing we can do obviously is in nature, but also we have to advocate and other countries who knows better than us. And it's affected so much in Somalia right now that. And the policy in Somalia, we, we involved. We really do involved a lot. And when we, when it comes to the women in Kota, we always advocate. And we need a woman to be part of the decision making, to be part of that and to advocate women like us, like IDB camps, women who need the justice. Sometimes we might not get we might not get the woman we need. We get women, but she's there, <laughs> but she's not advocating. She's not doing much, mm. and that is frustrating to us. And at the same time, we do want to hold the position. So mm -hmm. thinking, maybe one day, strong women who really have enough knowledge will come. So it's uh, we, we do that a lot, and we get a lot of respect for the government. This one or the other one, people respect us a lot. And we really appreciate that, and we push as much as we can. And in a divided society, I know that's a, it's, a, it's a difficult choice, so we may return to that to that question as well. There's a, um, another, I think a colleague of yours on the commission who talks about um, uh, women at the peace table and says it's not just about women at the peace table, it's about women peace builders <coughs> at the peace table. It's about women who will really speak for Absolutely. these issues and have that and have those those, so those important skills. When, the, when we're talking about in Somalia, women, it's very difficult to become an MB or something like that because the, the tribe thing. The old tribes, they want a man. So we want a woman to be there and to advocate other women. But by the time she's there, she go back to the tribe. And she, so we say, <laughs> why are you there if you're not talking? <laughs> so some of us does, but the main thing not. So hopefully we will get women who, like you guys, who knows what we're talking about and honestly wanted to be part of the change. Mm -hmm. And not only my tribe or my, what I wanted, my own, but how can I help the woman who needs me? So, yeah. so that might also um, fit nicely into that point of bringing young people back to rebuild their societies. So, um, yeah. um, and I know you had a follow-up question if we did actually work with Somali government, so we'll get back to you. But um, maybe if I do start with that question about how to really enable young people in North America that are interested in either contributing to their countries or in other countries that they don't necessarily have a presence. I was very um, lucky to be able to join something that exists. And um, if I think about, and this question has come up a couple of times for different young people that want to contribute, but are so far removed from the context. Mm -hmm. And 
What I would say is that I don't think that everyone has to start something from scratch at first. I think that there's a lot of opportunity of joining something that exists because it gives you an entry point to the community. It helps you understand what's being done, what's not being done, the, the chasms that exist in society and really defining where your best place to serve. And I think what is really refreshing about youth organizations particularly and youth movements at, across all sectors is that, and what they do better than I think uh, governments is that they are so intersectional. Mm -hmm. that they are much more open and receptive to receiving support from different people. And there's a lot of young youth-led actions that are happening around the world that I think can be something to join to inform how best to serve that community. And we try to offer that with, within our organization as well too, recognizing that there's so many young people that want to get their, their foot in the door, want to work in international development or for big multilateral institutions, but the barriers to participation are so many. You expect you to have 15 years of experience at the age of 20. Mm. And Fellowships are unpaid, internships are unpaid, you have to self-finance to be able to even go and do good and to contribute. So all of those barriers we try to alleviate by presenting an offer which is, if you can get yourself to Somalia, we can place you in our programs and house you and accommodate you and connect you to our programs and our network. And that could be at least a stepping stone and maybe a realization of what your next path is. And we try to push for more organizations to do the same as well too. If I think about what I know now and who I know now, if I knew it then, how could that support other youth? And one of the things I try to personally do as well too is try to share the network and resources of opportunities that exist, but somehow it's just not meeting the youth in North America that want to participate. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we collectively have to decentralize a bit more. Mm -hmm. We constantly hear about the potential and role of youth, and then we have issues around the world that need youth energy and you have young people that want to be involved but they're not meeting mm -hmm. and so I, I try to share the various resources that exist and um, I think the first thing I would say to any person that's interested in getting involved is connect with organizations youth-led that can host you first mm -hmm. you know, and I'm happy to provide resources on that as well too because I think we definitely could benefit from the energy and um, the skills that young people in North America have. Um, and, maybe, the, and the work on that. Yeah. She wanted to know about um, how you encourage young people who are living comfortably here or other places to go back to the. Oh, sorry, to Anusha's question. Yeah, she had Anusha's question. Did you want to. Were you going to say something? Well, no, what I, just what I wanted to say about, about that is that so often you hear about in, people focus on internships with the World Bank or the UN and those sorts of things. And I mean, with huge respect to the UN and the World Bank, that's not the real work. The real work is Elman Peace and those sorts of things. My first internship, supported actually by Government of Canada, so again, this is something maybe the government can, can be doing more of in supporting young people to be able to engage and, and, and have placements in, in youth-led and community-led organizations. My first work was in a really, really grassroots indigenous human rights organization in Asia, and I'm so glad that I didn't get posted to a UN internship because that wouldn't have taught me the real the real lessons that it that it taught me and enabled me to contribute in that way. And I think that you know, um, Minister Hessen and uh, Minister Sajid from the International Development Corporation too, they constantly talk about the the role of youth as well too, and where Canada's position on the global stage. So internships and fellowship opportunities like that for North American youth, enabled by the Canadian government too, that is something that I'd love to see more of. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. But to to your question about um, you know what are what are some of the drivers for, for conflict and the, you know, we, we work across many different typologies of conflict, um, not just in Somalia, but in the last three years, our work has also scaled to um, Nigeria, Niger, Cameroon, and Chad. And as of this year, Uganda, Burundi, DRC. And we look at you know, com countries that have had protracted conflict, newer and emerging conflicts, situations that are having the terrorism phenomenons and we try to do research to inform our programming as well too. And one interesting product that, knowledge product that we developed in partnership with um, UNDP was around the journey to extremism. And I'll use that as an example because there's so many different um, and factors that push and pull someone to join um, armed groups. But in that study, we were looking at the journey to extremism, looking at, there's a comparative analysis between two people 
same socioeconomic background, same village, same means, same family breakup. One finally picked up a weapon and joined an armed group, and one didn't. What was the final tipping point to understand why that person got involved? And um, more than 71% of the respondents said that the final thing that pushed them to join an armed group was oppression, um, essentially human rights violations, seeing their family members um, humiliated, beaten, tortured, raped, and wanting to be able to reclaim power. So that was really important because when we talk about terrorism and people that are joining armed groups, somehow people think there's some big scary person brainwashing people into joining the ideology. But really, it centers the message that human rights is not a box to tick after conflict, but it is a preventative measure to recruitment. When there is justice, when there is um, a space to actually get recourse against a perpetrator, when you can be free and self-determined and you're not marginalized because of your tribe or no one can use excessive power against you, people are more peaceful. And if we start to look at issues like conflict and terrorism from that lens, and not trying to look at it from a religious ideology and fundamentalism only, it completely changes the landscape of how we understand and respond to conflict. Um, but that's your question too about the influence of colonialism. It's also very important. I mean, Somalia, one part was colonized by the British, another part by the Italians, another part by the French. You had a little bit of the Portuguese over here. It's, um, and those remnants stay in society. Man-made borders, even in just one country, prevent you know, movement, um, how people trade with each other, how they interconnect, how they marry. How they... So the colonial past is something that we still see in Somalia, especially in a country that's, that has so much um, foreign engagement, mm -hmm. that even how countries fund and support and respond to certain regions has a colonial connection. The countries that support certain elements, certain, certain regions of Somalia, can be traced back to the, the former colonial um, rule that was there. And I think that this is very important to also recognize because organizations like ourselves and others, we, we're not contractors. We don't fulfill someone's mandate. When we engage different donors, um, the idea is that it's a horizontal partnership. Mm -hmm. One has money, yes, but one has ideas and uh, the capacity to, to implement. But instilling, enforcing, and protecting the interests only of uh, that country, so engagement in a region, is something you still feel in um, not only Somalia, but much of um, Africa. Mm, and the global south. It's and destructive. And, and recalibrating that power dynamic is important for the independent countries that we work in now. Mm -hmm. And I think that's. Um, Sadly, it's still something that we have to relearn mm. this many years after colonialism. Yeah. What you talk about in terms of that um, lack of a sense of belonging and being pushed into these spaces with extremism is something that I think really isn't understand, understood enough in the wider peacemaking community and yes. certainly in, um, in a lot of foreign policy and in these conflict affected spaces. We don't have a huge amount of time, so I'm going to take a last um, couple of questions. I'm conscious, Rabia, you had a follow up. Are you okay? You're going you're, you're gonna to sort of grab her in the, yeah. in the corner after. Great, thank you. Um, so I have one here. If people could just show their hands now, we will try to take a couple questions and then and then we will. Assalamu alaikum to both of you guys. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my name is Nora Almi and um, I'm a young person who grew up in Canada. I haven't really went back home. I just recently went to Djibouti. That was like my closest to Africa that I got this summer. Um, so I want to say like I really appreciate the work that you guys do. And um, as you're like you and your sisters, like when you guys went back, it really opened my eyes as someone from Ottawa saying like, what? They went back? <laughs> like, it's OK there, you know, because I, I grew up with the narrative of like it's a war torn country and it's not safe and we can't go back home and this kind of stuff. Um, so now, fast forward, I'm a social worker, a mental health therapist, mm. and you know I support a lot of clients here in Ottawa and just Ontario, actually, is where I practice. And I see that how like mental health is still a big taboo in our communities, mm -hmm. right? The young people mm -hmm. are, are biting into it, you know, mm -hmm. but because parents and you know just traditionally it's not something that's really common, it's really hard for people to seek support mm. and get support. And something really big that you said that I wrote down, similar to over there, like there, you were dropping gems. I like wrote <laughs> this one down. It's like you know we can't just be about the rhetoric 
project, like we have to have the resources. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is like, how could someone like myself with my expertise and my, you know, um, just knowledge around mental health like, support you guys here locally, but also um, internationally and back home? Like, yeah, I'd love to know that. She's ready to get on a plane with you back for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I want to take you back with me. <laughs> Fair enough. It's a good reason. Thank you so much. Uh, my name's Patricia, and I'm, I worked in Somalia a long, long time ago, before the wars, um, where I, as a single foreign woman, could travel safely anywhere, anytime. And so I'm hoping that Somalia can get back there. But one of the things I want to talk about, and it, it, it's sort of coming on from what Nora said and other people have talked about, is this question of social norms. Mm -hmm. I, I th this is a this is a difficult question because it come it can be seen as as a form of colonialism, as a form <coughs> of pushing values that are not um, you know part of the the country. So I'm I'm wondering how you do that, how you manage it, and also to to just pick up something that Meredith mentioned about the divisions within the country. These are divisions that may come because of oppression of human rights, but the ideology on the Al Shabaab side is, you know, pretty conservative, <laughs> and it's particularly towards women. So, I'm, those are the things that interest me. Thank you so much. And I think as much as you can speak about any um, areas under Al Shabaab control that you're you're navigating and, and how you navigate that, I think that would be really be of interest. Um, are there any other <coughs> last chance? Okay, great. I'm going to tack one last little piece onto this because I think, as I mentioned at the very beginning, um, you know, as we um, all seek to be actors in reconciliation here in Canada and really sort of trying to learn as well from the work that you're doing, I'd love for you to reflect a little bit on trauma in relation to mental health and sort of how you see that as really um, how you engage with that as part of your work because I think that that's something that we say a bit in Canada but we don't really know how we're collectively understanding and dealing with that in a, in a real way. So I would love thoughts on that as well. Sorry, I know the mic is behaving. And the, the mentally important about, I think we all have that. In Somalia, whoever's there, hundred percent they know of it, because you every morning you see something, nothing you can do about it, but at the same time bothers you a lot. And we all have that. You, for example, you see people like explode and die thousands one time. How can you next day clean it up and build the right way? So it, it's like something morally we need to feel this is what's happening and emotionally. So longer you stay, you're gonna be accepted. And Somalia, we, we, it, the mental issue is taboo, kind of. We don't talk about it, we don't do it. We have counseling, and we do a little bit, but it's not professional. Mm -hmm. It's not really professional. And that is the one of the things we're lacking in Somalia. For example, working with Shabab. You see um, the child when he was 10 went to Shabab. He saw all these horrific things. Like he can't sleep at night. He's always off. Mm -hmm. How can you help? So it's a, a, it, we need that Somalia people like you a lot. And we hide it, but we all need it, really. Especially people who live in under Shabab is the worst on oh, no, the, the other people. <laughs> and uh, for example, is one when it was a young guy who was staying with us. He left his mom, I think when he was nine. It was forced, they take her. That lady, she never traveled with car. She never came to Mogadishu. And her, her son was missing like, I think three, four years. She became so skinny. And she said, I wasn't eating anything. Mm -hmm. 
when we receive the boy, we communicate with her. We look forward. That's what we do. We always try to connect it with the families. And so we send her some money so she can travel to Mogadishu. It takes her three days to come to Mogadishu. Mm -hmm. So when she came, those three days she was thrown out because she never went to the car. Mm -hmm. When she came and she saw the boy, it's like, I, I couldn't describe. The way they connected, the way they were both crying, the way emotional. And then she stayed two days with us and she said, you know, I have to go back. And I can't take it back to where I came from. So please, my son can stay with you. I said, okay. I said, okay, he can stay with me. And when you see this kind of situation, it affects you emotionally always. And mm -hmm. Putin, the guy, the boy was staying with us for like three years. But we have the connection with the mom. She was talking to him, calling this. So that doesn't mean she's under Shabab. She wants that. Mm -hmm. But she doesn't have a choice. <coughs> so that's why all of us, it affects us. And we don't listen to each other. We just move, move, move. Mm -hmm. And when you talk to the person and you listen, you see mm -hmm. what they're going through. Mm -hmm. And uh, the council, normally as a Somali society, we don't believe it. They, oh, you can stop talk to me so you can change me. So <laughs> we don't, <laughs> we don't, we don't yeah. say we need that, but you can tell, you can see. When you see someone go through all this difficult and you have other one and they talk to each other and talk mm -hmm. and talk, you can see the change. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm not going to school for this, but I can see mm -hmm. what's going on and how the people change and how you emotionally connected together. And it's one of the things that makes me stay in Somalia because mm -hmm. when I see all these women and I stay with them and I have a tea and talk, talk, you feel relief. And they feel also. So it's we need someone like you. Mm. And just, <laughs> you know. Your plane ticket's coming. I mean just to add on that last point as well too about what we see, you know, anecdotally or you know, just through engagement with people that counseling, therapy, safe spaces to actually have difficult conversations are creating change. And there is a lot of stigma, but there is no clinical management like all social um, issues in Somalia. So there's definitely a complete sector industry missing there. And the WHO actually said that one in three, one in three people in Somalia suffers from mental health issues. And um, so our journey in uh, mental health and trauma healing really was based on how do we actually support people mm -hmm. to to overcome some of these challenges and. It just was not resonating. Traditional Western approaches to counseling, it's considered weak to talk mm. about the things that you should be grateful to have survived. Mm. So it just, it was, it was not getting through. So we started to explore alternative methods to, uh, to healing, to treating the somatic symptoms of trauma and really leveraging the, you know, the, all of the knowledge that exists around the world. And that led us down a journey of looking at surfing where we saw that it's been used to mm -hmm. treat PTSD in war veterans in the US. And thinking that we have the longest coastline in Africa, is this something that can work in Somalia? And we began to pilot that and it was um, incredibly well received. Mm -hmm. We are able to tackle questions around trust mm -hmm. and um, anxiety and um, um, having an entry point for conversations through the physical mm -hmm. activity of surfing. Mm -hmm. And um, we're building an empirical evidence base around that right now. And it's been an interesting journey. To your question too about challenging social norms linked to trauma, trauma healing as well too. And we also do yoga in Somalia. Mm -hmm. and, and this is very important, I think, what you raised too about values from outside and are they are you enforcing new values in a community and to be honest with you the movement-based therapy initiatives that we've launched whether it's sports whether it's yoga whether it's surfing whether it's art 
are not designed by, oh, it works in Canada, therefore, let's bring it to Somalia. It's really about opening something up to a community and see what people want to participate in. Mm -hmm. And the challenge that we have is when you talk about yoga in Mogadishu, people think, oh, this is a Western thing being brought to Mogadishu. The people there don't want to be a part of that. This is something from the outside. But when you do, people join. It's about creating access. Mm -hmm. And when you open something up to people, those that want to be a part of it, join it. And we've seen so many young men and young women participate in it. We have our caseworkers that have finished 400 hours of yoga teacher training and essentially could leave Somalia and become instructors in Bali if they wanted to, but <laughs> really using it as a tool to have conversations again, mm. especially in an environment where the concept of speaking about issues is not customary. We don't do mm. that. Even frontline aid workers. I've seen so many of my colleagues become disillusioned by the work, become burdened by it, become frustrated that international aid workers, diplomats, UN staff have to leave Somalia after three weeks. It's mandatory for mental health and well-being um, to come back a better version of themselves, to deal in that environment. Yet the people that are supposed to be pillars of strength in the community don't have anywhere to replenish their, their cup, don't have any person to speak to, to practice with, to talk about challenging issues, yet are supposed to be the support system for others. So these activity-based initiatives actually promote community, a support system, mm -hmm. but there is a lot of um, opportunity for doing it a bit more, um, I don't say professionally, but um, clinically, mm -hmm. and supporting the case management process of the mental health journey. So mm -hmm. whenever you're ready, you're, <laughs> you're very welcome. And I think just um, that, just as a, a message as well to outside of the mental health, what where we are positioned now as Element Peace and you know, graciously with the support of the KBF Canada is to be able to have more conversations like this. And we intend to in, in Canada and really show where the synergies are, where the opportunities for contributing are and um, you know, really socializing that you can be a part of something even if it's not in your own backyard or not from the country that you uh, are from if you are from another country or even digitally, d remotely, mm -hmm. if there's any positive thing from the pandemic is that we see other opportunities to influence societies, to teach and to create pathways for shared understanding digitally. And um, we're, we're looking to build networks with, with Canadians, both organizations and individuals to help us further our cause. So there's um, many ways in doing so. Elwood um, Fortune, thank you so much. I think I can speak on everyone's behalf to say that this is so deeply inspiring on so many levels to listen to the both of you talk about the work that you do. I think um, I'm quite certain that you've inspired some action today from so. the crowd, and I know that that, will, that that will ripple out. And so we're so grateful that you've taken the time to be with us today. We do have a small gift that we wanted to present to you. Um, so these are... Um, Teas. So, Fortune, that's for you. And Ilwa, that's for you. Oh, thank you. These are teas. You're, um, I'd invite you to take one out just so the guests can see what they are. These are cedar bark tea. They are um, they're a creation of um, a First Nations chef from Serpent River First Nation called Paul Owl. Um, and he has designed these based on a traditional cedar bark tea recipe. They are delicious. They are incredibly healthy. And so since we didn't give you enough caffeine, we're giving you health drinks instead. And the art on them is by a wonderful Ojibwe artist, Rhonda Snow. And they're just a wonderful example also of entrepreneurship and, and, and just really incredible, incredible um, local uh, initiative here that we wanted to share with you. Thank you. So again, thank you both so much. And thank you all for being with us.